What is up, everybody? Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk about Passover, COVID-19, Messiah, and the sovereignty of God. Yes, yes. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Messianic Rabbi Eduardo. Um, just want to wish you guys a Pesach Sameach. It's the 14th of Nisan right now. Tomorrow we're going to be celebrating Seders all over the world. Jewish people are going to be celebrating and commemorating what God has done for the children of Israel, what he did for them in the Exodus and in the redeeming them from Egypt. But I think there's things that we can talk about, things that we can begin to examine and parse with what's going on in the reality of our world. See, today we are suffering from what is the coronavirus, COVID-19, and what that means to people, that people are actually being quarantined. Probably for the first time in history, the Jewish people, the whole world is basically under a quarantine while the Jewish people are about to celebrate Pesach, or they're about to celebrate what the God of Israel has done. And that in the reality, no truer time has it been a necessity to lean on that pillow, to know that we can rest because of what God has done and what God will ultimately do in spite of the circumstances and in spite of the situations. But there is the reality, the reality that people are freaking out. People are losing their mind all over the place, right? And what happens is that when people get so consumed with things that are happening, things that are going on around them, and they're not focused on God, what happens is, is that people get broken. People make mistakes and they say some crazy stuff. When I was on the internet and Instagram and I'm, I'm streaming around and I'm looking at things, I saw this meme that said, Corona and Gamachia equals 316. And then I saw that also in 316, Mashiach Bo, which is means Messiah come. So in traditional Judaism, if you're not familiar with this, there is the Gamachia that is a concept found within Kabbalah. And this concept within Kabbalah draws parallels between words in Hebrew and the numerical value. So it tries to do a correlation, do a bringing together of the two so that there can be some kind of sense being made of this. But the problem is, if you walk this thing out, everything that means 316 can't line up with the fact that coronavirus or corona is on the earth or that people are suffering. I'll give you an example. 316 also is for Sith Lord. So Sith Lord has no spiritual correlation to corona or the Messiah coming. So I think perhaps we've gone a little bit too far. So let's look at this. I want to look at Romans 1 really quickly, and I want to read to you Romans 1, and I'm going to pull that up because I think it's important in thinking about as we go through a hard time, as we go through struggles, as we go through pain, and, and we, we feel the sting of, of pain, and we lose people, and we lose loved people, to, to think about what that means in the context of God. And the reason why we're going to Romans 1, because Romans 1 cuts to the heart of, of the condition of humanity, that humanity is bogged down by sin. See, the bottom line is this, is that we have people who are dying from this sickness. That we have people who are sick, going through hard times, people who are dying people who are afraid of getting sick. And then, and then we have to wonder in the midst of all of this, where is God? How can God be just for a child to die from a sickness? How can God be just for a grandmother to get coronavirus? How can God be just for the elderly who are usually seen as the most innocent in our society dying from this sickness, dying from this thing that's happening? How, how can God be right and just and I think the only time that we really bring about this question is because we don't understand the real true condition of humanity. But indeed, humanity is bogged down by sin. And I think if we don't rely on the chesed, the mercy of God, then none of us can stand before him at all. And I'm going to read to you Romans 1.18. And it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have clearly seen, been seen, 
being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they know God, knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling things. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. See, we miss the reality that none of us deserve anything. We miss the truth that every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of what God has called us to. And since we've fallen short of this standard of God, that the only thing we've ever deserved and earned is the wrath of God. And that's a heavy word to say, but even your most innocent grandma is a sinner and deserves solely the wrath of God. Myself included. Massive sinner, but if not for the mercy of God, I would never have been able to be made clean. And I think that's the point where when we start thinking about God's mercy, when we start thinking about God's love, that we start thinking about what we truly deserve, things begin to get, begin to get flipped on its head. That no human being anywhere, ever, at all, has earned anything in the sight of God. That we all rely on His chesed, His mercy, His rachamim, right? That God will look down upon humanity and send His Son. This is the point of everything, and this is the point of it all. So even your most innocent grandmother that, that you can imagine doing no harm, without the merit of the Messiah, your grandmother is solely bound for death and bound for separation from God. And, that, and, and so Romans 1 shows us that anything that is good inside of a human being that they do is because of the image of God. And that man consciously and subconsciously has suppressed the knowledge of God. One of the questions you might ask is, so how can God find me at fault if I'm unconsciously doing it? The reality is that there is something inside of you that acknowledges God in a sense and that you are pushing it down that you are rejecting that, retracting that, pushing away from that, and that man is actively doing this. And whether you say you know you're doing it, whether you say you, f you don't understand, the reality is that you are made in the image of God and there's a void that exists inside of you that beckons and begs for him. And that void that exists inside you, only God can fill. But yet sometimes we don't let him. See, there's a guilt of humanity. There's a guilt of mankind that always remains. And even the same way that Yisrael was redeemed from Egypt. When they chose not to walk in God's ways, they lay low in the wilderness. So what is it that God truly requires of humanity? At this time of Pesach, we think, what did Israel ever do in order to be drawn to the God of Israel? What did Israel ever do in order to earn the redemption from its Ryan from Egypt? And the, and the bottom line is that Israel did nothing, but it was for the sake of the patriarchs that God had made a covenant and a promise that he's going to redeem Israel. And these are one of the things that I think is important to think about and that what does, and but, but let's, let's, let's think about it from a different perspective a little bit. What about the one that truly is innocent? What about the baby that suffers or dies or the baby that is comes out with a sickness or a deformity that, that dies or stillborns or, or children who die in the womb and children who pass. How can God be just when he doesn't allow these lives to see the light of day? What about the children in Egypt? See, the narrative goes that and, the, and Scripture is true, right? That Scripture tells this story to us but that the God of Israel said to Pharaoh that I will make my name great, that he commands Pharaoh to let his children go and worship him. And when Pharaoh decides not to do this, God says that I will execute judgment against the gods of Egypt. See, the goal of God was to bring glory to his name. But the babies in Egypt committed no sin. And at the 10th plague, this is the Passover story that the blood should be put on the doorposts of the houses and that with the angel of death sees it, that they would, he would pass over that. This is where we get Passover, Pesach. This is, this is the, 
the thinking of a person's sin and wickedness not being counted against them. Yet the one who didn't do that, the firstborn of human beings and the firstborn of cattle, was to die. Now, one of the things I think about is what did these babies do to die? What sin did these babies commit in order to have their lives pay the price for the redemption of the children of Israel to Egypt? And I think it's it's one of those things where it is a tension in the scripture, where the scriptures are clearly speaking something to humanity that is bigger than just about the babies, that there is something bigger that the scripture wants to convey. And that is the pro God's process of redemption. See, we can't really say if coronavirus is a judgment of God or if it's not. What we can say is that God uses all things to bring glory to his name. So then in scripture, we get this pejon haben, the, the redemption of the son, that we get the, the redemption of the firstborn in scripture. And it's in Exodus 13. And it says in verse 15, it says, It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb. But every firstborn of my sons I redeemed, so it shall serve as a sign in your hand and as phylacteries, so it's a fault on your forehead. For with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. <laughs> See, I think there's, there's, there's something that in the redemption of Israel from the land of Egypt, going into the promised land, there was a sadness that's laid over the hearts of, of the Jewish people for the two millenniums, and more than that, in the commemoration of Passover, that the death of those that were paid for their lives is a costly price. That there's no difference with the God of Israel between Egyptians, Jews, Jamaicans, Filipinos, and, and all of the flavors of humanity. Right? But the Lord, in being a righteous judge, calls Israel to a time of memorial for the fact that the firstborn was slayed. That indeed the sins of the fathers do indeed get paid by the sons. And this is this is this is a tension in the text. In a sense, when we read Exodus 13, it seems as though God is looking to call Israel to a memorial of those who gave their lives on their behalf. So either way, if we find somebody that is is completely innocent or we find somebody who's completely wicked, right, that, that there is no difference between, between the person in and of themselves and of their own actions because all men sin, right? All men fall short. But yet God is a righteous judge. He looks down the corridors of time. And, I, and what I think we miss in the midst of all of this is God's sovereignty in choosing who lives and who dies. And that we can't choose who lives and who dies. We don't choose that. But God in his infinite wisdom is able to look down upon humanity. He's able to look down the corridors of time because he exists outside of time. And to bring about what is just and right. See, Abraham himself, when he's going through through Sodom and Gomorrah and he's going through the battle about what was about to happen when Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed, Abraham mediates between, between God and Sodom and Gomorrah and he asks God, will not the righteous judge do right? Will the Lord not judge righteously? righteously? And of course, I'm paraphrasing. But it was an expectation by Abraham Avinu that God would be righteous in his judgment in dealing with people, even if it brought about the death. See, I think the context of slaying the wicked and the righteous is a little bit misunderstood because there is none that is truly righteous without the merit of God, without the chesed of God. This is how David too found favor in the sight of God, that it was God's mercy and God's grace that allowed him to, to fall before God and have a relationship that Psalm 51, David says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. 
Genesis 8, 25, it says, Far be it from you, Abraham said, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And, and that is my very question that I want to present to you guys as we're thinking about Passover coming up and we're thinking about God and all the plagues and, and the suffering sometimes that we, we deal with at the hand of this broken world, right? Is God not just? Does our perception of the reality dictate the justness of God? We're frail human beings that we can't see beyond the dimensions that we exist in, but God who exists outside of time is absolutely able to make the best decision he needs to for his creation to be able to come to know him. But I don't think we like that. I don't think we understand that. See, we want God to to give us things. We want to name it. We want to claim it. We want to bring it down. We want to profess these things for ourselves and we want to hold on to them. Yet this comes from an understanding as if God owes us. God doesn't owe us anything. He loves us and gave his son for us. And in the fact that he gave his son, we can walk in newness of life, right? That we find ourselves at the foot of Messiah, looking to be made anew, to have the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and to walk in his holy ways. See, any other way is a, is, is a way that is, is error. You want to find man-made religion? Find a religion that looks inward to humanity. You want to find a religion that is focused on God? That is the true religion, the religion that looks outward. So, things to consider. As we think about coronavirus, and, and, and I'm sure some of you have family members that have passed and family members that have, have been sick and, and people that have died from cancer and all different types of sicknesses. And we have to ask ourselves, in, in the reality of all these things that are going on, all the pain and the suffering in the world, the COVID-19, the, the quarantine, the shutdown, um, people, children being born with deformities, all, all, the, all the murder and the craziness in the world and the sin and the darkness, Things that affect us, things that impact us. Is God actively involved with these things? Does God care? Should we only take good from God's hand and not bad? Or do we not understand that sometimes the things that God lays out for us, in the end, though we know we struggle, God will bring about for his ultimate good? Perhaps not. I mean, I think about Job. Job was a, a man who, who suffered things that I couldn't even imagine. Losing many of his family members and his health and his body. And, and even his wife said, you know, look, man, why don't you just curse God and get it over with? And Job's heart was a heart that I think we need to try to hold on to as believers in this time with what's going on. And just not in this time, but in, in every single time, everything that you go through. Every hurt, every pain, everything that doesn't turn out exactly the way you want to. You need to have the perspective of Job. Job 13, 15 says, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. See, there is something to be said about someone who trusts, even without having the understanding of how things are going to ultimately play out. We can make a lot of cases from creation and what God has done in history and, and his, his, his power to preserve the world and its perfect balance that, that had it tilted a bit more this way or that way, that, that life would never have had been able to be started. We need to trust in the, in the intelligent designer and the creator of the universe that, that he knows exactly what he's doing. That by nature, God must do right and must do just. That there's, that there's no other way that we could perceive of a God being truly God, if he is not just the establisher of morality, but he holds up everything that's true and just. I think the answer to the sovereignty of God needs to be put into the context that we can't go beyond these doors, beyond these walls, beyond the knowledge that has been given us, that we can't, we can't see sometimes five feet ahead of us, yet we want to try to make decisions of who lives and who dies. And even though we might have the cases of every human being who's not a baby, they are bound by their sinful nature. And if they don't come to Messiah, death and separation from God awaits them. And that's the truth of the gospel. And I'm not going to backstep on that. But what about the babies that are lost? What about those who come to Messiah 
and are living brightly before him. What about the Jewish people in the, in the camps who were children and, and, and babies who suffered at the hands of the Nazis? How do we how do we deal with a God who is just when some of these some of these things seem unjust? We have a precedence in scripture that someone who was a manslayer, if he if he killed someone unintentionally, there were these places which were called cities of refuge that they were able to retreat to. And in these cities of refuge, no next of kin avenger could kill the person who killed someone accidentally. And then we have something something interesting in the scripture. If we go down to Numbers 35, 25. It says that the manslayer should live inside the cities of refuge until the death of the high priest who was anointed with holy oil. So what is the significance of this? See, the high priest is, is, is pointing us to something bigger, something greater. And it's a principle within Judaism that the death of the righteous atones. And it's, and it's not just a principle within Judaism, it is a principle within the Tanakh that a righteous person can substitute themselves for the unrighteous. We see that in Isaiah 53, and we see that in other places as well. So who knows? Who knows if perhaps the Egyptian babies? Who knows if perhaps the children in Nazi Germany, as terrible as that was? Who knows if your elderly grandmother, who's a believer in Christ and a believer in Messiah, who dies of coronavirus, or, or children, God forbid, if they die, or people getting sick, cancers consuming people who have given their life to the Lord, children being stillborn and sick. Who knows if perhaps these blameless lives, which we can agree are, are, are blameless lives, in Messiah, no condemnation, right, that there is, a, that there is a, an innocence bestowed upon a child, that if a child dies, we know that child is, doesn't have that, 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 embrace of sin who knows if these innocent ones these truly innocent ones are somehow pausing the wrath of god for a moment that somehow somehow their death is paying the price for for the things that we have gone through and i'm not saying that's the absolute answer what i'm saying is it is something to think about Even the temple system, the temple system that existed back in the days of the Hebrew Bible was a system that always pointed to substitutionary sacrifice. And, and I'm willing to talk about that all day because the whole temple system, the whole tabernacle, the whole Mishkan system points to a greater redeemer, which is Mashiach, which is King Messiah who gave himself on behalf of the whole entire world. You know, there are genocides all over the world where many people are dying, many people are suffering, many people are broken. Many people are treated unjustly. Perhaps God slows his wrath in those points in order to give more of a people to turn to him, to get a greater number to enhance the kingdom of God, to come into the kingdom of God, to come to know him. And then even in talking about the high priest, we have a high priest in the order of Melchizedek who, who goes before us, right? And the reality is that we're all in cities of refuge. We've all been in those places of limbo or those places of, of being incapable of being pleasing to God. If not for the death of the Messiah, if not for the death of the high priest. And indeed, he's the high priest, he's the prophet, he's the king, he's... He's all of that, that he encompasses all the roles that he borrowed off to humanity to declare his glory in the redemption action of history. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Yeshua, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was also in his house. See, we see a connection being drawn between Moses and Yeshua. For he's been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And, and sometimes in the Messianic world, we forget that, right? 
But just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Messiah was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our hope firm unto the end. And quoting Psalm 95, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 3 goes on to say, Today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as when they provoked me as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Even though there had been the price paid for freedom, there were many who left Egypt who never chose freedom. And never choosing the gift that was given never allowed them to enter into the promised land. I don't want to see anybody who's listening to this or thinking about these things or having ideas about these things to allow the time of Pesach to pass you by and to not think about the redemption that God did in history and the redemption that God would ultimately do when he cracks the sky. These are the things that I want you to think about. See, our perspective needs to be a perspective that is focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and if we don't have that perspective, we're continually going to be looking around in the dark. We're going to constantly be bumping into different things. And we'll never truly arrive to where God wants to take us to. Although we face many trials and many hard times, what we do in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those hard times, really show where our faith is at and where we're at with the Lord. See, the goal of the Lord is to bring glory to himself. Let us not focus inward and focus on ourselves like it's all about us and it's all about the trials that we go through. The trials that we go through are to show that the faith we have is true faith, that it is a true faith that is pushing in to the God of Israel so that we can come to know him. And in the season of Pesach, this is what it's about, right? It's about laying everything down because there is a greater Egypt that we've been delivered from, and that is this whole entire world system. And the very purpose of the God of Israel going through the land of Egypt and, and allowing those plagues to come down, says the Exodus 12, 12, he goes through the land of Egypt on the night when he strikes the firstborn. And he will strike them down in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. See, there is a sense that all the other gods are under judgment. And indeed, humanity, unrepented and not turning to the Lord, is, are all under a judgment as well. And the greater deliverance, as I said earlier, I'm going to say it again, is the deliverance from the greater Egypt. And then from Malachi 111, from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. See, God's desire, God's goal and God's hope and God's, God's striving and creation of humanity is not so that we can sit around and feel good. That's the byproduct of it, right? The bonus is that we get to enjoy God's presence and have joy in his presence. But the point of God, his creation from the beginning to the end of time, is so that his name might be magnified and sanctified and lifted up. This is the purpose of it all. This is why God allows things to occur. Because God is ultimately going to be just. He's ultimately going to be good. He's ultimately going to bring about the right things that need to bring come about. But he will allow judgment to fall. And he will allow things to happen in order to magnify his name. But the magnification of his name doesn't mean that he's a bad God or evil God or looking to destroy humanity. He's looking to lift up people, to draw them closer to himself, so they could be in fellowship and relationship with him. And this is the purpose of it all. And this is what I think we should be thinking about in this season of Pesach. What are the pharaohs that I've been delivered from? You know, that's a, and when you look at the Haggadah, in the Haggadah, it doesn't mention the name of Moses. And it doesn't mention Pharaoh. And the reason why it doesn't is because we should think about the specific name of Pharaoh. That we should think about the redemptions that we've, been delivered from the pharaohs that we've been delivered from and i think at this time as as a nation as a world as with suffering from covid 19 and and there's there's atrocities happening all over the world where lives are being lost i think we can remember the sanctity of that life and it's not lost on the mind of god if you go into the haggadah once we get to one of the cups of the plagues where you dip your pinky in it and you and you take out a drop of wine or of grape juice and you put it on a napkin next to it for every single one of the plagues. And that's done to show that 
that because of the lives that were lost due to some of these plays, due to these darknesses, that there is a diminishing of our joy because of the loss of life. And, and all life is sacred before God. This is, this is the very purpose of the new covenant and the extension of the new covenant to the nations being able to participate in it, that God is desiring to bring humanity together into one unit, right? To create that one new man that we could stand before him and celebrate those things that are his. So during this time of Pesach, during this time of quarantine, during this time of just madness, I want us to remember about the bigness of the God of Israel and the bigness of you, Yeshua the Messiah, and the bigness of, of what he can do in his power and his capacity. Remember, everything that we see before us came by the creation of the God of Israel. And we should have no fear because his arm is capable of doing what it needs to do. He has enough power and majesty to bring about and to keep his people. We just need to make sure that we're his and, and to rest and receive the gift of forgiveness and the forgiveness of justification before the one true God. I think that's the purpose of it all, man. So that's it. I'm going to wrap it up. I just want to say, Chag Sameach. Enjoy. Celebrate with your loved ones. Those of you that have in Zoom Seders, enjoy them as well. And pray for your family. Pray for the ones who don't know the Lord. And, and pray for Jewish people all over the world that are looking forward to redemption from this Egypt as well. All right. God bless you in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Peace out.